we're going to do now is shift gears a bit and look specifically at the heart. Um, look at how the heart coordinates the heartbeat. Um, and that will lead us directly into our lab. So the first part, what we're going to talk about now is kind of more like kind of continuation of lecture. Um, um, and then that will lead us directly into into the lab, um, which will be the EKG lab. And again, which will be a lot, a lot quicker than when we do it in person, because we're just going to talk up show you a picture of somebody hooking up themselves up to the machine rather than actually getting to do it, which again, which is a little disappointing. Um, all right, so we've been talking about the heart. The atria and the ventricles. The left side, the right side. Um, we need to talk a little bit more about the anatomy of the heart. Um, the meat of the heart, the part that is made out of the cardiac muscle. Maybe I should go use like my. This is the part we call the myocardium. The part that's actually going to be squeezing, you know, that is obviously partly cardiac muscle. And it's also connective tissue that provides structural integrity and actually stabilizes the valves. So what we call, it also includes the fibrous skeleton of the heart. So fibrous cell, you know, connective tissue. Uh, maybe I'll make it green. Um, So this fibrous skeleton tissue, this fibrous skeleton of the heart does two things. One is it reinforces the valves so they don't like, you know, rip apart when everything's under pressure, but it also electrically isolates the atria from the ventricles. Right, because we've been talking about how cardiac muscle has the gap junctions, so they're all connected to each other. Did I? I did mention that. Yeah, so they have gap junctions. So normally, if you excite one cardiac muscle cell, its neighbors get excited. So in this case, if you excite the atria, the atria will contract, but it won't automatically spread to the ventricles. And we're going to have a special pathway, the internodal pathway, that's going to actually be responsible for that. Um, other things, so myocardium, you know, the lining of the of the chambers is just what we call the endocardium, also known, you know, as the. It's basically the same as the endothelium. It's basically simple squamous epithelium. Um, we don't don't worry about that so much right now. And um, we should talk about the um, outside. Um, and the outside is a version of a serous membrane. And maybe I should, was gonna we're gonna do one of these little like side boxes right now, and introduce the idea of the serous membrane, and then bring it back to the heart in just a, a couple of moments.
So the basic idea here is a lot of the organs in your body are pretty active. Like your heart is beating and squeezing and squishing. Your lungs are inflating and deflating. Your stomach and intestines are smooshing your food around. So there's all this stuff moving around inside your body. And right, if you rub things together, they get hot, you get friction. So we need to have some way to reduce the friction as all these internal organs are beating or breathing or smooshing. And that's the role of these serous membranes. These are double layered with slippery fluid in between. So the idea is whether it's your heart or whatever other organ it is, let's just let it be your heart right now. There's gonna be two layers. I said it's double layer. There's gonna be the layer that's against the actual organ, which we're gonna call the visceral layer. Viscera just means organ. And then there's going to be a parietal layer. And then there's going to be this slippery fluid in between. So you can imagine as the organ moves around, whatever's on the other side here, as this moves, you know, the, the main motion is gonna be between the two layers of the serosa um, sliding over that slippery layer. In fact, let me, Right, um, yeah, I need to turn off my background for a second to do this properly. Right, here is two layers, right? You think of a Ziploc, it's got two layers. Here's some slippery stuff. I'm gonna put this slippery stuff inside. Um, oh, I'm gonna... Okay, so here I have my little Ziploc, two layers. Notice the two layers, you can't even tell it's two layers. It looks like one layer, but it's two layers with the slippery goo in between, right? And now, I, if I have my two hands and I'm going like this, they're totally, like, like they're heating up like nobody's business. They feel hot. If I take this and put it in between and do that, they're not heating up at all, right? Because as my hands go, it's the slippery fluid in between there, letting the two sides of the Ziploc slide past each other, and there's no friction. And therefore, I could just keep doing this again and again and again, and I'm not actually heating up my hands. I'm not wearing everything down, right? If I was doing this like this, I kept going like this, so I'd probably be bleeding after 10 minutes, right? So these serous membranes, are around your heart, around your lungs, around your digestive organs, like your stomach and your intestines, and allowing them to move and slide past each other with no friction. Um, the other important thing about these serous membranes that's gonna be important when we get to the respiratory system is that, like notice that even though it's two layers, they're really right against each other and there's a vacuum in between. Like these don't pull apart. 
that I can't pull apart the two sides of the bag because there's a vacuum in between. So that's going to actually be important when we get to pulmonary ventilation. There's like a serous membrane that's against your lung, a serous membrane that's then against your thoracic wall. But when the muscles of your thoracic wall pull, they're going to pull and expand the volume of the lung as well. So this vacuum in between the two layers is important. Um, are there any questions about what I mean by a serous membrane or serosa? Um, all right. So, and actually, I realize this thing has been on the wall. Can you could could you see that in the, my little my picture of me in the corner? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. I meant to actually go go full on, but then I actually realized I forgot. Um, all right, so, which means I don't have to redraw anything here. Um, so there you've got an idea that cirrhosis, you know, when you get into anatomy, there's more, more fancy names as you get into subparts of, but for this class, you just need to know three main cirrhosis. You know, around the heart, is the pericardium. That's the one we're going to look at in just a second. Around the lungs, you have the pleura. Around your digestive organs, the peritoneum. Right. And the peritoneum, if you've been in anatomy, you know, is a greater and lesser omentum and transverse mesocolon and the mesenteries and all that stuff. So, um, but for right now, we are going to focus on the pericardium. So around the heart, you're going to have one layer against the heart itself. It's going to be basically my visceral pericardium. Also called the epicardium, but it doesn't matter. There's going to be another layer, which is going to be the What was the lacerosa and what did oh, the lacerosa was the, the peritoneum, which surrounds all the digestive organs, the digestive viscera. So peritoneum. So visceral pericardium against the heart, this parietal pericardium, which is the other layer, the fluid in between, which allows the heart to slip and slide against the surrounding things in your chest. The thing that the heart has that other things don't have is a fibrous layer that reinforces the parietal layer. So there's actually this fibrous layer here that reinforces the parietal pericardium. So we call it the pericardial sac. Right, so if you actually crack somebody's chest open looking for their heart, you're not going to see it. You're going to see a little leathery bag pulsing inside the middle of their chest, which is this pericardial sac. And you've got to actually slit that open to actually see the actual heart inside of it. So again, your heart is in this slippery lined bag to make sure that it's not rubbing against everything. And your heart beat like somebody did the calculation from the moment your your heart starts beating until you're dead. It never stops. There's something around three billion, like billion. That's like one zero 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 beats that never stop until you're dead. Um, it's kind of impressive that it lasts that long without breaking down or destroying itself in there. Um, if for some reason you have buildup of fluid in here. That's called tamponade. Okay. 
know, that can be bad because if there's pressure in there, that's going to make it harder for your that your um, chambers of your heart to fill properly because you're getting pushed in from. So normally that's a potential space, right? It's got slippery stuff, but it's not really a space at all. But if fluid does build up in there, that's called cardiac tamponade. And that actually is a problem because it's going to make it harder to fill your your, your ventricles there. Um, okay. The last thing we need to introduce is just the basic parts of the cardiac cycle. So basically, diastole is the word for relaxed. Systole is the word for contracting. So you need to make sure you know these words because we'll use them a lot. Diastole, you know, when I was learning this, I kind of remembered like diastole, die. If like everything was totally relaxed all the time, you'd be dead, right? You know, systole is the squeezing. So systole is squeezing, diastole is like the relaxed refilling. And basically, most of the heart is, most of the time the heart is in diastole. The heart is relaxed and refilling. There is blood that has been either at the lungs and are coming back and returning into the right, the left atrium or blood that's been at the body and is returning back here into the left in the right atrium. So the blood is returning from the body and the lungs entering into the atria basically just flows through the atria into the ventricles and kind of it starts filling up in the ventricles. You know, when the heartbeat starts, there's just, you know, it's not like the atria fill up and then transfer it all to the ventricles. Most of the blood just pours through. Um, but at the beginning of the heartbeat, there is a squeezing of the atria to squeeze out any last bit of blood that's been sitting in the atria. So this is where we're being. The heart is relaxed, it's refilling, and now the heartbeat is gonna start. You know, and the, basically the heartbeat is gonna be, first the atria are gonna go into systole and squeeze whatever last bit they've got into the ventricles. Um, there's got to be a little pause because if the ventricles were squeezing, it wouldn't be able to actually transfer the blood. So, you know, we've got some atrial systole here where the atria transfer the blood and then the big squeeze ventricular systole where we push the blood out to the body and the lungs. So that's going to be the basic thing. There's going to be diastole where everything's relaxed and refilling. Then we kick off the heartbeat, starting with the atria contracting, followed right away by the ventricles contracting. And then you go back into the diastole, the rest, you know, relaxed and refilling. So let's look at this now in terms of the actual electrical, electrical coordination. Again, it's going to matter that we have this fibrous skeleton that is providing electrical insulation here. So the whole thing is going to start with this little place in the wall of the right atrium called the sinoatrial node. also called just the pacemaker of your heart. This is coordinating everything. When somebody gets a pacemaker implanted, it's a little electronic thing that takes over the role of this SA node. Um, so 
So this is going to be kind of, you know, the master master node. This is the thing that kind of controls everything else. This natively beats around 100 beats per second. Like if you just had it disconnected from the nervous system, it would beat about 100 beats per second. But normally, around 70 beats per second. Oh, oh my god, somebody nobody stopped me beats per second. That would be crazy. Your, your chest would be ah! beats per minute. So normally, it's more like 70 beats per minute. What division of the nervous system do you think is slowing it down to? Parasympathetic? Exactly, parasympathetic. And what is the main nerve coming down that is actually delivering that parasympathetic inner paras parasympathetic innervation? Vagus. The vagus nerve. Right. If you actually cut your vagus nerves, your heart would speed up to about 100 beats per minute because normally it's staying a little lower because of kind of just kind of chronic parasympathetic stimulation. All right, so the SA node is going there. Um, this is appreciably faster than any of the native autorhythmic frequencies of any of the cardiac muscle. So this thing is going to be able to kind of and train all the other parts of the cardiac muscle um, because before they even have a chance, like, what's my rhythm? It's like they get another message that's originally coming from the SA node, keeping them in line. So SA node is going off. When the SA node goes off, that excitation is just going to spread across the entire atrial muscle. Remember, because the atria are all connected by gap junctions. So we're going to have atrial systole. Right when this thing goes off, right? Um, this atrial depolarization, as all the atria muscle contract, that's going to be what we call the P wave of the EKG. Now, EKG is basically you put electrodes on somebody's skin and you see these voltage swings that are actually being generated ultimately by the cardiac muscle as it depolarizes during contraction. So, you know, we're going to be looking at this thing we call the P wave that is the beginning of each of these things. Not him. The beginning of each heartbeat, you see this P wave, which is basically the atria depolarizing as this heartbeat begins. And then, so in this during atrial systole, that's when basically any of the blood that's still in the atria gets squeezed down into the ventricles. And then we're going to be ready for the main event, which is the ventricular systole. That's the squeeze that's going to push the blood out to the body and the lungs. But we need to have a little delay before that happens. So there's another node here. This is going to be the AV node. This is the one that ultimately controls the ventricles. So atrioventricular node. And there's this thing called the internodal pathway. And it takes about 0.1 to 0.2 seconds before the signal actually makes it to the AV node. So after the P wave happens, 
there's always a little delay of about 0.1 to 0.2 seconds before the next thing happens because of the delay of this internodal pathway. And we'll talk about some of the things that go wrong if something's not working with that. Um, so then after this 0.1 to 0.2 seconds, we now have activated the AV node, which is now going to cause ventricular systole. So, so I guess two is going to be this little delay. Due to this pathway, but then we go into ventricular systole. Right, ventricular systole is because now those are all going to get excited. Um, in order to make the ventricles all contract really tightly all together, rather than you know have the excitation slowly move across from one cell to the next cell, like eventually, if you excite one, you are going to excite the whole family down there. But in order to make it happen faster and tighter. There are these specialized um, cardiac muscle cells we call Purkinje fibers that send the message really fast. Um, the main bundle of fibers going down the middle is called the bundle of Hiss. Then it splits into the right and left bundle branches. And just continuing up into all these Purkinje fibers, basically these conducting cells that spread the depolarization. So what this means is when the AV node goes off, that that excitation spreads really rapidly and strongly across all the ventricular muscle as it all depolarizes that is going to become what's called the QRS complex. So kind of back over to here, we call it QRS, 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 QRS. So this, this whole big thing here, this is happening from the ventricular depolarization. Right, this was atrial depolarization. Um, if we kind of go back over here, I should mention this during ventricular systole, there's actually two parts to it. So the ventricles are squeezing when the ventricles first start squeezing, you know, I, I got it, let me put the, um, put the aorta in here. So here my blood is going to be going off out my body. And we talked about there being the um, semi lunar valve there to make sure that the blood that's going out the aorta doesn't go back into the heart. So when your heart is relaxed and refilling, your blood pressure is not at zero, right? Um, we're going to talk more about this when we get more into blood pressure. But when you are not having your heart actively beating, your blood pressure is still pretty high. It's like what we call the diastolic blood pressure. So there is blood pressure, blood pushing against the vessels. There's blood pressure trying to push back into the heart. It can't go into the heart while the heart's relaxed because of this semilunar valve. But we have this diastolic pressure sitting here. I can't do it. Diastolic blood pressure, which is pushing back. So when we start ventricular systole and the heart tries to push the blood out into the body, the body with the blood in the body is pushing back. So you start squeezing and squeezing more and more 
um, but nothing happens. You just start getting stronger and stronger, pushing against the valve, but the diastolic is pushing back too hard. So that's going to be called isovolumetric contraction. So if we, so when ventricular systole starts here, you know, part A is going to be isovolumetric contraction. So the ventricles are squeezing, but they haven't squeezed hard enough to overcome the diastolic pressure that's sitting on the other side of the, of the semilunar valve. Finally, the pressure inside the ventricle overcomes the diastolic pressure, in which case the blood can get ejected, and that's called ventricular ejection. And again, ventricular ejection occurs occurs you know, when you exceed the diastolic blood pressure. Again, think about think about there. You're in a saloon. Like this is okay. Bird's eye view of the saloon. It's kind of looking down um, and here's some saloon doors. The saloon doors will only swing this way. And here's you and you're trying to get into the saloon and push in there, but there's these other dudes here pushing back against there. And unless you can push harder than these guys pushing on the other side of the swinging doors, the doors aren't going to open up and you can't get through. So this is like isovolumetric contraction. You're pushing, but not hard enough to overcome the dudes who are pushing back and keeping the doors from swinging open, keeping the semilunar valve from swinging open. But at some point, the ventricles squeeze hard enough, squeeze harder than the diastolic pressure on the other side. The doors swing open, ventricular ejection, the blood can move out of the ventricle into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. That, that makes sense? Okay. So if we come back here, we have pretty much described what we call the intrinsic conduction system of the heart. Um, Wish I, I'm gonna just write it on here since it's so messy because you should know these words. You know, it's called intrinsic because it is contained within the heart itself. Like I said, if you had like some zombie go and rip somebody's heart out of their chest. Wait, this looks like Groot. It shouldn't it should look like a zombie. That Groot heart. Could do it too. What's that? Groot could totally do it too. Groot could do it. It's true. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Um, so the heart is going to keep beating because the heart is got its own internal pacemaker that is triggering everything. You know, if you yank somebody's lungs out of their body, the lungs would just sit there. The lungs work because You've got constant signals coming down the phrenic nerve, and unless the diaphragm is connected to the brain stem, you're dead. Um, if you've ever, if you've, if you, if you've got fish, if you go fishing and you gut a fish right after it's been killed, you like smack its head and 
slid it open its belly the heart's still beating in your hand it's really weird um you know the fish is dead but the heart takes a while to die um so the nervous system can speed it up can slow it down but it's not at the core generating the signals that keep it beating it just kind of modulates its activity Oh, I and also I should mention the, I think in your um, study guide, I used some words that one of the old authors said once that I just thought were hilarious. It was like, you know, because it says, you know, the heart stripped of its romantic cloak, because like in a lot of our kind of culture and poetry, we always think of the heart as, you know, emotions and love and this and that. And you know, in this class, we strip the heart of its romantic cloak and we just look at a hunk of meat that's pushing your blood around, basically. Um, so that being said, it's affected by emotions, obviously, right? It speeds up if you get all excited, particularly through the mediation of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, all right. So in our lab today, You know, here's a person. Here's their heart. You know, as the heart is beating, the cardiac muscle is depolarizing and repolarizing, just like we saw with the skeletal muscle. Um, there are some differences in the way cardiac muscle works, like the calcium is not released in re in, in inside is not released due to ultimately the deep the initial depolarization but a subsequent influx of calcium from the outside and don't worry about the details about how cardiac muscle is different from skeletal muscle that way but the basic thing that this muscle is depolarizing and repolarizing is going to be the core of the ekg so just like the eeg electroencephalogram we put electrodes on somebody's skull and then saw how brain electrical activity was measured. Here we're going to put these things here and we can just see how is the voltage on the skin that's shifting due to the electrical activity of the heart. That's all an EKG is, is electrical activity measured on your skin that is ultimately being generated by the heart and then you're measuring it kind of out here on the skin where it's happening rather than sticking electrodes into the heart muscle which would be bad um you know the heart the one we're doing in our lab is this simple it's literally just on either arm and you get a nice little ekg um, if you're doing a more formal diagnostic e e e e EKG, there's all sorts, there's like 12 electrodes, there's the main ones and little ones, they stick on your chest and stuff, but it's, you know, it, we're not going to do that for this lab. For this lab, we're getting just to the very fundamentals of the EKG. Um, Again, sometimes it's EKG because German cardio is with a K. So ECG, EKG is really the same thing. It's just whether you want to say cardiogram or cardiogram. Um, and like I said, measure there's the first wave, the P wave, which is going to be the atrial depolarization, the QRS wave is going to be this is ventricular depolarization and then there's a little dude the t wave which is ventricular repolarization So this is after the ventricles have contracted 
and are coming back to resting potential, you get another little bump, which is the T wave. Um, you know, I agree it's a little non-intuitive that repolarizing, it should be going down, but instead it's another positive bump. And that's because we're not, not actually sticking electrodes in the heart muscle. The actual relationship between the voltages on your skin and what the heart's doing is not as straightforward. So you just have to trust that seeing that little bump go up for the T wave is actually the ventricles repolarizing. Right, and the atria, then the atria repolarize as well, but it just kind of gets lost. Um, this part, this QRS complex, the ventricles are really having high voltages and they overwhelm anything that you might have seen from the atria repolarizing. So yes, the atria obviously must repolarize, but you're not going to see it as part of the EKG. Um, what is, do you think, normally the delay? What's the time between the P, what we call like the PR interval here, from when the P wave starts to where the QRS is going? What's going to be the time between the P and the R? 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. Exactly, 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. Assuming everything's working right. You know, that's one of the things that you're going to actually be checking when we look at the actual EKGs in the lab in a little bit. Um, I'll talk about, so I should mention, when you're interpreting EKGs, they are ultimately only giving you information about the electrical activity of the heart. I should say ultimately just only electrical activity from the heart. That being said, People who are skilled at interpreting EKGs can actually figure out a lot of stuff um, because different kinds of conditions can result in typical EKGs that people who are trained can recognize. Um, but ultimately, this doesn't tell you for sure that the ventricle is actually pushing the blood. It's just telling you that the ventricles are depolarizing and trying to squeeze. Right. Um, let's look at it. There's two. There's two common problems that we actually do see in the class sometimes. So let's talk about. I'll draw it and see if you can tell me what you think is happening. So what is weird about this EKG that I just drew here? One of these beats is not like the other. One of these beats is not like the rest. Can you guess which beat is not like the others for? Oh, I didn't, I got a rhyme. The middle one has an extra P wave. Exactly. All right, we go P, whoops, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, ACK, P, Q, R, S, T. So we missed a beat. So this actually is not that uncommon. Um, we see it sometimes even in the students who are hooking themselves up in our labs during the class. And what is happening? What would cause the P to happen and then there not being a QRS?
How does so it... I have this and when I went to the doctor, my cardiologist said it was from one of my AV valves. I forget which one she said, but one of them like doesn't close completely every time. So it's not going to be so much from the valves um, with the, the electrical. This is going to be more of an electrical issue. If we go back to this picture here, you know, the P wave is when the SA node fires off, but then it's relying on this intranodal pathway to then continue the excitation 0.1 seconds later down at the AV node. So if this intranodal pathway for some reason is being intermittent, that's what's going to cause that little orphaned P wave, kind of skipping a beat. The P wave happened, and the rest of it didn't happen because the signal died before it made it down to the second part, the AV node, to trigger the QRS. You know, therefore, it's just the next, luckily, you know, it, it only happens every once in a while. So the next time the P wave goes, you get the heartbeat again. So, if you see something like this, it's evidence that, you know, that internodal pathway can be intermittent, isn't always making sure that the signal gets to and excites the AV node to continue the second part of the heartbeat, the ventricular systole. Um, another common thing we see in the class is this. So what's going on with this thing? How is this different from a normal heartbeat? Something is happening with the ventricular systole. Exactly. Notice the ventricular systole, this QRS is all spread out. It's supposed to be this tight boom, but instead it's like a blah, right? The ventricles are, are, are depolarizing, but it's much slower. It's happening more slowly. That happens when you have bundle branch block. If these conduction pathways that are designed, designed, I should, that typically spread the depolarization quickly throughout the ventricles if those are blocked the ventricles will still ultimately depolarize and contract but it takes more time because each cell has to excite its neighbor 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 so the depolarization is much slower to spread across the ventricles so when you see something like you know like this this is more what we call like from bundle branch block Block, blick, block. Um, okay, last thing before we take another little break. So I'm talking about the ideal situation where you get your atrial, atrial systole, ventricular systole, and back in the diastole and refill, and then you just keep doing this. Um, and this is again driven ultimately by this SA node is actually you know starting the whole thing here. So what happens if something goes wrong and things are not all being well behaved and, and trained here? Um, if the heart muscle starts just kind of doing more chaotic quivering rather than being um, locked into the nodes, we call it fibrillation. Fibrillation, kind of chaotic quivering. I just kind of like that word, chaotic quivering. 
Um, like I said, the cardiac muscle has its own intrinsic ability to be autorhythmic, but if it's just kind of random, it's not so good because it's not actually coordinating to pump your blood anywhere. It's just kind of splishing everything and making not doing anything useful. Um, the most catastrophic is if you've got ventricular fibrillation. Right, this is really bad because the ventricles, their job is to make sure we're pushing the blood out to the body and to the lungs. And if the ventricles are just in, you know, currently doing chaotic quivering, the blood is just sloshing around. It's not actually getting pumped to where it needs to go and you're gonna die pretty soon. Um, how can you, what, 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 what's the kind of quick way to try to deal with this right now if you catch somebody who's in ventricular <laughs> fibrillation? Use the paddles. Yeah, so it's the AED, put those paddles like, all right, boom, boom. You know, it's basically putting a big electric shock across their heart. You know, and the basic idea is the system is kind of crashed, kind of like your computer froze up. And it's like, oh my God, what am I gonna do here? It's my computer's frozen. Uh, let's turn it off and turn it back on and let it reboot. And it fixes it like 99% of the time, right? So that's kind of what those paddles are doing. It's basically power off, power on, power cycle your heart, and hopefully it reboots and it's back into its normal rhythm. So that's ventricular fibrillation is very um, kind of critical because you need to make sure you get the blood out to go into your body. Atrial fibrillation is not uncommon. You can have atrial fibrillation. That is not going to be like criti as critical. You're, you're not going to die right away because the atria, like I said, they're responsible for squeezing a little bit of extra blood down into the ventricles, like maybe 15% of the total volume of the ventricles at the heartbeat starts maybe came from the atria, but the atria are not critical for keeping the blood flowing. But what happens if someone's an AFib, they call it the blood kind of ends up splooshing around and doesn't have a nice flow through the system. And when the blood kind of sits around in pools, it's more likely to end up forming these errant blood clots, those little um, thrombuses. Right, and then when those finally break free and then go out into your system, that's what gives you a stroke or a heart attack. Because when it's an embolism, it goes out and then hits, gets into some small vessel and blocks it. So atrial fibrillation is not de not, not like kind of deadly in the moment, but over the long term, it's definitely something you worry about. People end up on kind of maintenance blood thinners to make it less likely they'll get a blood clot due to their atrial fibrillation, for instance, as well. Ventricular fibrillation is like catastrophic. You know, your ventricles are not going to pump the blood out to your body. So you're, you're going to be toast pretty soon. So any questions about any of this? Okay, so Let's take another like 50 minute break and then we will do the actual lab, which is going to just basically be a kind of more practical introduction to what, how we measure these um, and how we kind of interpret them. <laughs> 